Hi everyone, welcome back to the campaign. We've brought you back to the same peg we was on last time, 99 on Lake 4 here at Partridge Lakes. We're going to run you through a different set of tactics today, how I'd approach the lakes at this time of year. Obviously last time we touched upon sprinkling micros, um, maggots down the middle and then a bit of soft pellet in the edges fishing off the bank. Today it's going to be slightly different, a little bit more shallower water, a little bit more positive fishing and just basically I'm going to run you through the tactics that I'd use at this time of the year. I'm going to run you through one of my first of my three lines. I'm going for a three line approach today. I'm going to try and target some big carp in my margin later. I'm going to fish hard pellets down the middle because of the depth and I want to try and catch a bit of everything there. And then I'm going to cover the other option which is across to the far bank. Now, where you choose to fish on that far bank is really important. This time of year, the algae started to die, the water's going a little bit clearer, the temperature's going a little bit cooler, so the fish start to drop down that shelf a little bit. What I get a lot of people saying is, fish were coming in my peg, but I couldn't catch them. And that's basically because they're spooking themselves. They're coming into the margins or they're going across onto them mud lines. And basically the fish are coming in and they're charging out of the peg again. They don't want to be there. So we're finding a sensible depth where the fish feel confident you know, that's my first plan of attack. So, let's go over there. Let's have a little look at the shelf itself and why I'm fishing where I'm fishing. So I'm not gonna go right into the back of the, if I go right into the back of the reeds here, you can see it's probably half the depth of what I've actually got to start with. So I don't wanna be fishing there. Now, it looks like the perfect place to fish on this peg. Obviously, the peg's changed a little bit since last time. The reeds have grown up and things like that. We've got plenty of cover there. So if I chose to fish here, what you'd basically find is that it's a little tiny bit deeper, but basically you're fishing on the shelf. It's starting to slope down. So you imagine my hands, that far shelf. What I'm looking to do is get on top of it slightly. So what I'm gonna do is go to the left-hand side of this weed bed, and you can actually see here, you can see there to sort of all the way up to the reeds, it only changes by about an inch. So what that means is the gradient at the bottom is very slow sloping. What I don't want to be doing is fishing on a, a fast shelf where it drops off quick because basically your bait will roll down the shelf. So I don't want to come back like where I was fishing last time on that little two and a half, three foot line. That's more for sort of winter and when the water gets, you know, the fishing is not as good. What I want to do is just go up to the edge of them reeds, fish on that nice flat shelf. And that for me is nice. I've got probably an inch over depth. The body is just out of the water. I'll probably take just literally a couple of mil off that, so I've got an inch of depth over depth. That means that my bait stays nice and still. But yeah, I'm reasonably happy with that. I'm quite happy with where I've picked there. So that's going to be my first plan of attack. So I'm going to run you through the actual rig and setup that I'm using today. I'll start with the top kit itself because I think this is really important. I'm actually using a F1 kit, which is like a short kit. It's only about 5 foot 10 inch in length but obviously I have 12 inches where my puller kit is, which means that I end up with about five foot of elastic. And that to me is really important because it gets the fish under control, means that you're not gonna be having loads of elastic stretching all over the shop. The elastic itself is gray hydroelastic. Now gray hydroelastic might sound a little bit heavy for F1s, but it's, a, it's quite a forgiving elastic. And you've got to remember that the fish are fighting quite hard this time of the year. And I've got potential as well of catching carp from sort of six to eight pound as well. So moving down to the actual line, I've got 017 N gauge on this. I've got a number eight cube about four inches above my float. That's just to control it if there's any skim or if the fish are pushing me rig about, I can use my back shot to actually control my float, stop it moving. The float itself is 0.3 of a gram. It's a Wilkie Slim and it's a 1.5 mil bristle. Moving down there to the shotting pattern, the shotting pattern itself is couldn't be easier, six number nines, and that sits on top of my hook length loop, and then my hook length is all 13 to a 16's SLWG, and that's three inch in length. So my bulk probably sits about three and a half inch away, just means that I can see every positive indication, shows up your bites really quickly, and it also keeps that rig pinned in position. The fish are still quite active for this time of year, so you are gonna still get a few liners and stuff like that. So starting the session, if you remember from last time, we were talking about sprinkling pellets in, not feeding a great deal of bait, trying to attract them fish into the peg with the noise of the pellets going through. This time of the year, we're still fishing soft pellets because we still want to catch, you know, small stockies, bigger F1s, odd carp. The difference when it's warmer and the water temperatures are up is the fish are a lot more active. They'll come to your bait a little bit quicker. So 
you've got to think about how you're feeding it. I'm going to feed micro pellets, four mil expander on the hook. Everything's slightly beefed up. Obviously, I've got all 13. We'll talk about that in a little bit. My pot itself is a medium one, and I'm just going to fill that up. And what I'm going to do, I'm not going to be doing no sprinkling. This is what you call clumping. So my bait is going to go down in one go, hopefully get to the bottom, the fish follow it in, and they have to go down. What I don't want to do is create a column of pellets going through, which could likely to bring the fish up. You're always going to get a few liners, so what you want to try and do is eliminate as much as possible so you don't foul up fish. So we'll get over there, line up with the marker where I plumbed up, and I've got a little bit of tape on my pole there, which basically tells me exactly when I'm on my mark. So once that's on my mark, same as last time, elbow and el arm tucked in, 90 degree angle. Your pole pot is an inch back, so again, make sure you compensate for that. As I lean forward now slightly, I put my pellets in the water, let them release. Lift my float, probably four inches, let it straighten so that my bait is right on top of it. I've got a little back shot just to control the line. There's no wind today, the conditions are actually quite nice. And then I'm just sitting and waiting for a bite. I'm not a big fan of lifting and dropping. I don't lift and drop a great deal. The reason for that is you don't lift and drop a method feeder. You know, you chuck it in, you sit there, you wait for your bite. This is the exact same principle. You're trying to set a trap, let the fish come to it, hopefully get your bite. If you miss your bite or fish bow waves out your peg or anything like that, then you've got to start again. So we sat there now just waiting for a bite, see what happens. The biggest thing at this time of year is regular feeding, keeping that bait going in. You know, don't ever think, oh, I'm going to overfeed it. I'm feeding a medium-sized pot today, which is quite a lot of micros, probably well over 100 micros. But the beauty of micro pellets is they hold fish in your peg for long periods. If I start getting lots and lots of bites, I can cut my bait back a little bit. But to be honest, this time of the year, they will eat the bait. They'll come into your peg, they'll find it, and they'll keep eating it. So I'll sit there nice and still, nice and patient, no moving the rig, just keep everything dead dead accurate, dead on your little spot. So there we go, first fish of the day. Probably took about three minutes there. I was just ready for thinking about shipping back and the float's just gone under. So, great start to the day. What normally happens, this is typical of obviously starting your session on pellet. You normally get a quite a quick response. Let's see if we can get this one in. So first chuck, fish, great. And you'd be thinking, right, what do I do now? Well, basically you carry on and repeat the process. So what, what I would say the biggest thing that people go wrong doing is they don't feed regular. I try in this time of the year, if I've not caught a fish within three minutes, I try and refeed. It's a nice fish. I try and refeed every three minutes. You've got to keep bait going in. So that one there it took about three minutes. I was just coming to the end of my chuck. The best way for me to explain it is think of it like a conveyor belt of food going through your peg. So let me get this one out. There we go. Nice common to start with. I'm not holding him up. Think of it like a conveyor belt of food going through your peg. If you have a big gap of not feeding, the fish are going to lose interest. If you keep putting it in too regular, so if I feed every minute, I'm going to get a big build up of bait. When the fish do then come in the peg, they're going to be harder to catch. So what I want to do now is stick to sort of three minutes, feed. If I've not had one, after three minutes, back in, refeed. I'm happy with the amount of bait I've got because obviously if I'm catching good sized fish like that, they can soon mop it up. Hopefully, I'm not feeding too much where I'm going to put off the stockies and the F1s as well. So, again, fill my pot up, loosely fill it to the brim. When I go over there, I'm just going to put my pot right where I want to fish, online with my tape, repeat the process, and we'll just see how the peg develops from here. One real important thing is obviously the amount of bait you feed. Don't just pick up any old pole pot. We have pole pots in different sizes and different shapes, basically to allow you to do different things, i.e. feed more bait, sprinkle your bait, clump your bait. Today, I've opted to use the medium pole pot because I feel that's the right amount of bait to feed. And I've opted to take the lid off as well. 
because I don't need it. I don't need to sprinkle bait. I don't need to slow release my bait. I just want to push my pellets in. And this is what we call clumping bait into the swim. I can turn the pot round, I put it on the water and it just releases the bait naturally because it's got holes in the bottom. And one little nice little hack that I do myself as well is I enlarge the pots just to emphasize that release of the bait. So I get a little pair of scissors, chop out the hole a little bit bigger. And this is what, what I basically use for all my clumping. It's no good for maggots now. I have to use the standard pot as it is originally, but for pellets, that for me is, you know, my number one choice. So you've seen me loading my pot up, you've seen me putting bait into it. One little thing you've got to get right is the pressure that you squeeze them in with. When you overload your pot, you're literally just thumbing it in, just enough to hold it from falling out. If you press it in too hard, your pellets won't release. So try and get the pressure that you squeeze it into absolutely spot on. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's not as hard as it looks. Gently press it in. If it does that, that's going to be perfect. So I've just had another carp fishing across. At the moment, everything's going to plan. Brilliant. Fishing's pretty simple when it's like this. You go with a method, it starts working, great, everything's good. When you're catching, you naturally feed again. You feed again because you're catching. Where people struggle, so I'm just going to put another formal expander on. Where people struggle is when it starts going wrong. So, when I feed this time, obviously, third chucking, let's see what happens. As you start fishing, your bites will either tail off or the fish start coming into your bait a little bit quicker and you start getting line bites. So one really important thing, before you put your bait in, make sure your pot is fully turned round, put it right where you want to fish and just gently lower it onto the water and gently lift it up. You'll see my pot's just gone clear, that means my pellets have come out of my pot. And what I'm trying to do here is make as little noise as possible. If you make too much noise, if you bang your pellets out or you sprinkle them like we was doing in the first episode, then what happens is the fish will respond to that noise and come to your bait quick. So what we're trying to do is just sneak the bait in. Feeding fish will bring other fish into your peg, so don't think, oh, they'll never hear it. They will. These fish will know exactly that, where that bait is and they will find it quickly if, if they're in the area. So sneak that bait in, get your rig right in position and then sit and wait for a bite. Now, as I said, one of two things is going to happen. Either, there we go, so a little bit of a liner there. First missed bite we've had. Get that float straight back on top of that bait. Um, one of th two things is going to happen. Either we start getting a few indications, missed bites, things like that, or the bites stop. Now, if the bites stop, that's where people start to struggle. What you've got to do is maintain that feeding, so keep feeding regular. So, at the moment, I'm getting a response within three minutes. Every time I feed, I'm getting a response within, say, one minute, one minute 30, which means that I'm going to wait no longer than three minutes before I refeed again. If I don't refeed again, the bait will get at, the bait will get distributed and spilt around the peg as the fish waft it about, and your area of feed is basically non-existent. It's all over your peg then. So the reason you're refeeding is, one, to bring new fish into your peg, but also to focus them back to one little spot. So this chuck, I've had a little miss bite or a liner. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, right, in my head, I'm not actually counting, but in my head I'm thinking, right, I've roughly got about another minute, minute and a half left of this chuck. And if I've not had a fish, whether I'm catching or not, I'm going to come back in and refeed. So I'm getting a little bit of a sign there now. There's a, definitely a fish in my peg. You've got to give the fish enough time to actually eat the bait because obviously you can't just keep piling it in. It's going to take longer for them to find your hook bait. But likewise, if you stop feeding, you lose interest, the activity starts to slow, and that's when your catch rate's going to slow as well. Hook bait choice for today is a formal expander. The reason I'm using a formal expander, everything eats it, simple as that. Feeding micros, formal expander is a little standout bait. It's not too big, that's why I'm not choosing to fish like six mil expanders but 4mm will catch anything from a stocket all the way up to a 10 pound carp. 
Preparation wise, again, all I've done today, just kept it nice and simple. Got some lake water in a pellet pump, put my pellets into the pump, give it one pump and that's all. Not, I don't want them to sink like mad. I'm just literally one pump. It just speeds up the whole process of getting your expanders to expand quicker. Put them into some water, left them in a little bait tub, some are floating, some are sinking, not really bothered because the hook itself is actually going to weigh the hook, uh, weigh the actual pellet down. So dead easy way of doing it. One little tip I would give you is don't go crazy on the pumping because you will soften your pellets up the more you pump them. So no bites there. I'm going to come back in. My three minutes has passed. I need to refeed again. If I don't refeed, then nothing's going to happen. I'm basically going to sit there for four, five, six minutes, nothing's happening. So what I want to try and do is keep them fish coming in the peg. So repeat the process. Formal expander on the hook. Fill the pot. Overload the pot so it's almost overfilled so that I know I'm filling it right to the brim. So that way I know I'm feeding exactly the right amount. If I feel like I need to up my feed, then I'll step up a pot size. I won't just start cramming more into my pot. I'll just overload the pot, fill it to the brim. If that's no good, step up to a large pot, fill that up to the brim. If I want to sw swap back down, I'll switch back to the pot. I'm a big believer in switching pots rather than half filling pots or cramming too much into a pot. That way I can work out exactly how much bay I need to feed. So I'll turn my pot over, line it up where I'm fishing, onto my marker, gently lift up, Pellets have come out, get my rig right on top of it. And then my trap is set now. So sit and wait, and then hopefully we get a response or something happens, get a bit of information from what the fish are doing, how quick they're responding to that bait. If they respond quickly, i.e. if they're coming to the bait within a minute, I need to be feeding every, say, two, two and a half minutes. If it's taking two minutes to get a bite, then I might wait a little bit longer. I might wait three, three and a half, four minutes for a, uh, before I refeed. Like this is how you work out how often you need to be feeding. You'll hear people say, feed to your bites. But that doesn't mean if you don't get a bite, don't feed. You've got to feed again. At a certain point, you've got to feed again. So this time of the year, when the fish are there, you can go in, you can catch them. The two fish we've had today, both good stamped fish. You don't need to be catching hundreds of them to catch a good weight. So patience is a little bit of, you know, need a little bit of patience. It is quite important, but likewise, you don't want to be waiting too long so that you lose total interest of the fish. So again, I've been in there within a minute. There's a little tiny, I can still see me float moving ever so slightly. So I know there's a fish there and that's within a minute. So that's telling me they're coming to the bait pretty quickly. So I need to feed a little bit quicker because they're coming just like a mouse would on a mouse trap. Come in, if he takes the cheese, there's no reason for him to come back to the trap. So if that fish comes in, has his little feed and then leaves the peg, I have to redraw him back into my peg. And the only way I'm going to do that is by feeding. So I'm sat there now and in my head, I'm thinking, right, I know a fish has been in, but I've not caught him. He's not made a mistake and picked my hook bait up. Therefore, I'm going to give it probably another minute and a half, another minute from here maybe, because I've probably been in a minute, minute and a half anyway. And then I'm already thinking about refeeding again. So I'm constantly building my peg up that way. So you can see there, I missed a bite that time and the fish bow waved out of the peg. It would have been a carp because obviously it's two foot deep there and if I've seen a bow wave, it's obviously quite a, a, you know, a decent sized fish. So what I need to do, rather than me sitting there, my chance is gone. Exactly what I was saying about that mouse trap effect. Fish has come in, it's looked at the bait, it's hit the line or whatever, it's gone. Now I need to draw that fish, fish back in. If I drop my rig back in there, which is common with a lot of people, they'd think, well, there's still bait there. Well, yes, there is still bait there, but the fish is left. You know, you're not going to get tons and tons of fish in two foot of water because otherwise your float would be like this all the time. So what I need to do is reset that trap, come back in, refeed and start again. Try and imagine it as if you was feeder fishing. That's like your tip getting pulled out of position. You wouldn't just leave your method feeder there in place because it's been dragged away from your feed. This is the same sort of principle. So fill that pot back up, start again. Hopefully we'll keep feeding 
we'll keep feeding, keep redrawing them fish back in the peg. In terms of what bites you're looking for, what you'll notice is I lift at anything that's fast, anything that stabs down, try and ignore anything that's sideways movement. They're just fish brushing into your line. All you're looking for is the imitation of that fish sucking that bait up, which will give you a fast indication on your float. Now, striking wise, again, I'm lifting rather than striking through the bait. One, because I don't want my pellet to come off because you've got to ship back and start again. And two, you don't want to be foul looking fish. So if the fish is off the bottom and you get a sharpish movement, you don't want to be hooking it in the belly and foul looking fish. So little gentle lifts. If you don't, if you miss it, you're straight back in fishing. If you don't connect with it, it's probably a liner anyway. So that right there is typical of pellet fishing. I've gone two chucks, not a single sign, but I've kept up my feeding. And then three chucks later, by keeping that bait going in, I've gone in and I've ended up catching one. Now I could quite easily go in and get a little run of two or three fish again now. Sometimes they will scatter and you've got to keep feeding because you've got to draw them back. If you don't feed, you know, and I can't stress this enough, if you don't feed, your peg is only going to get worse. So this is actually our first F1. We've only had carp hooks now. Hooked perfectly, top lip, really nice. Probably a pound and a half, pound and three quarter. But that importance of feeding regular, even when you're not getting signs, you know, a couple of chucks there, no bites, no liners, third chuck, get one. There's nothing to say now, I won't go in and get three and three chucks, and then nothing. But the biggest thing I'm trying to st stress with this style of fishing is you've got to keep putting that bait in. Try and work out how often you need to be putting it in. And the only way you can do that is by working out how quick the, the fish respond to the bait. So when they're there, it, are they coming in your peg within a minute? Are they coming in your peg within two minutes? Basically, double that time. If they're coming into your peg within a minute, minute and 20 seconds, and you're getting an odd liner, try and feed every two and a half minutes. If it's taking a minute and a half, two minutes for them to come in your peg, try and feed every three and a half, four minutes. And that's basically I'll work out my ratio of how often to feed. Right, that line's gone now, which is typical of what happens on these snake lakes. You know, they're only narrow lakes. You, the fish do move on different lines. You do catch what's in that area and they do go. People say, well, when do you know when to move? Well, I've had five or six chucks there and I've not had a single line and no indication. So obviously they're not there anymore because when they were there, I was getting signs, I was getting indications. You can't sit there for 45 minutes and thinking, or they'll come back, they'll come back because they won't. So we've got two other lines to look at. We've got a track line and we've got a edge line. So what we're going to do, look at one of them lines and see if we can keep some fish going in the net. If you enjoyed the video today, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any queries or questions that you want answering about this particular line that we fished today, drop them in the comments section below and we'll try and get back to you and get them answered.